five. But our advice from deep DEP and FEMA is, if the certified appraiser gives you that value, they're the certified appraiser. Yeah, we've been you could ask those. for a second one. However, right. we typically, if you're somewhere near, we're not going to argue the point. Seems and, like a compromise. Yeah, though. and it generally has not been a problem. Because yeah. um, obviously that would put an unfair burden on the current um, homeowners that want to redo the windows that we all need to put in and, and all that, or redo the roof. Uh, right. But but fifty percent of the market value over ten years that that's fair and a, a good compromise. Uh, um, where we good. Run, thank you for that. Very briefly, where we run into a problem is when you find an older home that hasn't been touched for yeah, yeah. thirty or forty years, and somebody buys it and wants to improve it but doesn't want to raise it. That fifty percent is eaten up very quickly with the cost of a kitchen today, new windows that are usually right. going to be in a wind zone, so they're right. expensive. So right. they eat those values up very quickly when what they typically really do is want to elevate it, but the costs are so expensive, yeah. so they have to make choices right. as homeowners. Right. Thank you. Other questions, Roseanne? I, I yes. interrupted um, you. Can I ask a question about the pre-addition before mm -hmm. I move on? Oh. Um, I was okay. just going to say, sorry, I'm Alex Felsen. Um, I worked with uh, Guilford on the Coastal Resilience Plan and have worked with a, a few other towns. Um, and I think one of the things about communication, which I think is a great question, is thinking more holistically about where the folks in the town are in terms of their understanding of the risk mm -hmm. and their, um, their perspective. Right. And thinking about uh, communication, as this is one step, and also in, in initiating a dialogue and communication strategy that is, uh, the, the, that's a beginning that also may, for example, in Guilford, we um, used television and radio and kind of got the word out so that it was pretty um, broadly heard. Uh, in part to get more of the towns, townsfolk who had concerns or issues or who had property that they were, um, that were low-lying to uh, feel invited and to be part of the discussion and the debate. So I think part of the question is whether, uh, where you stand in terms of your willingness to take on some of the discussion and debate and how much of an issue it is, uh, you know, and which is partly a question of the number of homes that are at risk and their location and the adaptation potential. Uh, and thinking about how you want to negotiate and communicate the, um, this kind of adaptation strategies over time. In Guilford, there were quite a few properties that were repetitive flood loss homes, and it was, it's, um, and, but in, in the thing about Connecticut is that there are many homes that are, uh, there are homes that are at risk, and there's a lot of homes that aren't at risk, so there's a real discrepancy or di um, differences across, you know, homeowners within <coughs> the town. Well, thank you. That's helpful because as you're talking about this, I'm thinking that we do have already in existence several neighborhood associations yes, along the beach, beach area communities. where it yeah. would be easy uh, to mm -hmm. arrange forms, information forms for mm -hmm. them. Now, are we under any kind of a time frame here but from uh, the state or from the federal, from FEMA for uh, taking action on this? To implement this? this. No. 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 I mean, I think the community rating system that, that we were, you were talking about is a critical mm -hmm. uh, thing to um, recognize and to be, you know, to maintain a role in and to um, build up because I think that's, um, I mean, you may talk about it more, but that's an, I think that's an important role that any, any municipality you know, I can play. I disagree. We're, uh, Victor and I have talked that we have met with, with, with the state and, and, and some of the FEMA folks, and we think we can get to the next number, which would, would be helpful. Uh, we have to do some things in my region. We have to look at some additional areas, so a lot of uh, uh, inland wetlands and some tidal wetlands that we might be able to get credit for and might get very quick moves. So we're looking at things that we can do with minimum effort and cost. As we all know, we have minimum staff to get a lot of things done. You're going to have to talk in that microphone, Bill. You've been around long enough to know that. So, but, but we heard you. We got okay, you. So we're good. But if you, if we're you good. keep going, I'm going to get you on that microphone. We're good. All right. I'm and, good. And I would add that I, I think. Good. No, you're not. Mm -hmm. one, one of the opportunities is thinking about future funding. Yes. Uh, and I think that. It, well, I don't okay. okay, that was next on my list. Okay. Do you have any money? Clairvoyant. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's important. I think there's, there is a value to establishing a dialogue locally and to um, building up, um, building, you know, integrating with the community rating system, staying on top of these um, criteria at the state level so you. Uh, so that you can position yourself for funding opportunities and, and also teeing up priority projects and uh, having those in the kind of ready um, for advancement as uh, funding sources become available so that you can um, so that you can apply so that you can have 
um, uh, have a convincing argument that there's an opportunity for that funding to be effective in the community? I was thinking in particular of the uh, sewerage pump stations, mm -hmm. which definitely fall in the area of public health. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's your suggestion that there is uh, funding currently available, or we're going to have to organize to try to get funded? I mean, I think we're going to have to look for the funding a little bit and do some research and where we're going to find it. Uh, but one of the slides, there's a number of different like EPA, mm -hmm. NOAA, so the, the, the funds could come from anywhere. Well, I was just wondering if they had any particular inside info they might share with us. Um, yeah, good question. I think that that's, we did, we have a list of funding potential that we pulled together. Um, but we haven't really targeted specific projects um, that you know from the town to those those project to those uh, funding sources. But that's something that I think we would be interested in exploring in the in the next phase. Or in the next phase, we'd be interested in you exploring that too. <laughs> yeah, I think that that uh, certainly certainly I think for our town that would be a very high priority okay. in the interest of obviously public health. Mm -hmm. I I have a question. Yes. Um, have there been any studies uh, with re and with respect to the pumping stations? I mean, it just seems intuitive that you, you don't want to elevate a pumping station if you can help it. I, I, and, uh, but at the same time, you have this problem that you know, the pumps are going to be low anyhow. Um, have there been studies about hardening these types of buildings and strategies for hardening them against uh, you know, like a, a border, impermeable border around the building. Has there been any work done uh, in that area? Yeah, definitely. Um, we we've been doing some work like that in the Boston area. Stantec. You know, I'm a planner, but I uh -huh. sit with a lot of engineers, and I sometimes look over their shoulder, and they're designing movable walls for for pump stations. I've seen that a as an option. Um, good first step is just to get the the power higher. Right. You're not even elevating the building, yeah, but uh, like generator. each of these requires a, a pretty close look. But the, I think there are options where you can keep the pump where it is and, and build a build a wall around it. Uh, good good what would that would be? What would that be constructed of? Uh, Materials. Could, yeah, you could. It could be an, a, a mix of concrete, earth, me, uh, metal, for the different barriers, depending on what the what you needed. I I know there are inflatable moats or. Or not really a moat, but a, it's a barrier that can be inflated uh, to surround a, a key structure. Mm -hmm. And there's flooding uh, down in the southern part of the country. There was one guy that did it. He had this system for his house, and he was the only one that didn't uh, get his house wiped out. Wow. And uh, it was pretty impressive. It was about a three foot high tube that he pressure he was pressurized, mm -hmm. and uh, like a huge inner tube. Neat. So I don't know. I don't know if those are some kind of. Uh, you know, infrastructure that could be looked at as well. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think with, with pump systems, you have to you have to think about how uh, what the elevation they're at, what their what their function is, uh, where what you know if it's gravity, if it's um, right. where it's pumping to, uh, and where the discharge point. Um, you know, the um, the invert and expiratory for the system. So, yeah, it's something that you have to investigate and. and, and Part of what I think is useful for a town to do is to think um, near term uh, to identify the critical facilities at risk, but also to think about longer term and to think about uh, maintenance and operations uh, aspects of infrastructure and to be um, uh, strategic about uh, um, you know planning ahead so that you know you're not making short term decisions that that um, where you're putting money into something that's not going to um, be accommodating to future sea level rise. Right, that's yeah. true. Great. Any other questions on the sustainability study specific? I have a couple. Um, right. Am I correct to assume that any potential funding sources are municipal related, vice individual property owners? Or is there some individual funding sources for someone who's in a flood zone who wants to take some corrective action? So you're saying, so you're asking whether funding is mostly available for individual uh, homeowners or for I'm assuming it's mostly available for municipalities. Yeah. I don't know if there's any yeah. available. It's for harder individuals. to it's harder for individual homeowners who have um, kind of uh, like nuisance or or, uh, or um, housing or property specific challenges right. to get uh, funding right. from the sources that we recommended. Okay. They usually like to. There is opportunities if if there are multiple homeowners who band together and identify. Um, 
a opportunity that's more of a holistic or more of a, a, a broader scale benefit. There are opportunities to for that kind of, um, it's what we were calling in Guilford zones of shared risk. So areas of homeowners, pa patches of homeowners that share sim a similar risk and have an opportunity for example, for collective septic or for a collective wall that also ha adds upland ba um, benefit. So there, is, there are um, ways of negotiating opportunity, but it really tends to be multiple fit, multi, um, multiple home, homes, not individual, typically. Okay. That's good to know, though. Really good. My next question is, as the sea level rises, the flood zone designations are going to change. Some, the, the VE one's going to expand. The, the once in a hundred year one's going to get bigger. And it's in addition to Roseanne's questions, where if someone's going to make a renovation, how do they know and what should they invest in when they're making a renovation? People's FEMA flood insurance bills are going to change as the zones change. And as someone who got surprised by a FEMA insurance bill once that fortunately I didn't need and I only had to pay for it for one year because there was a misinterpretation of where the zone was. Um, mm -hmm. um, how's the best way to communicate that? Uh, yeah. And it's maybe the same answer to someone who's considering doing, doing you know, renovations. But this number you had up there, if I remember correctly, was $12,000 for a year for an insurance policy. And when you go from $2,000 up to $12,000 just because sea level went up X amount in inches, that's going to be a shock to a property owner, independent of investing money to raise their, right. their, their home. So I think some methodology of communicating, and no one can predict when FEMA may or may not change the zones, but as soon as they do, that word somehow, I think it's incumbent upon the town to the best of our ability to get that word out to the affected property owners, because they're getting their bills in a matter of months after FEMA changes the flood zones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the projects that Bruce had mentioned to me that was doable and you would get credit for it under the CRS program was to create a brochure that you would sell it, have a QR code, you could scan it, and right there on your phone, he, he was talking about well, you would get everything you needed to do in an emergency or an evacuation. These are the steps you should take. That was an example, but you could similarly have these group of students provide a pamphlet, an education piece of material that gets mailed out to all the homeowners in, in, in that program and, and at least educate them knowing, hey, the, the flood zones may change. So there's opportunity. Well, they're going to change with rising sea level. That's, it's no question about it. They're going to expand. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And, and the, the question, how, when's FEMA going to change their map? Well, it may cause them to pay a little more attention to you know, sea level years. changes. Right. But, yeah, I think uh, of all the projects, we, we have a couple that we identified with clear. So we just got to align, align the students with those projects. And I'd like to yeah. just request a copy of this presentation. The insurance slide wasn't in here that I could see. Okay. Um, That's a shock value for someone who has to yeah. see their insurance <laughs> rates <laughs> jump. Okay, well, I think so. So I mean, there's so there's storms, there's storm events, near-term storm events, and there's uh, longer-term sea level rise issues. Right. And they're just they're they're sort of two different uh, challenges, and the sea level rise is a slower process. Understood. Uh, and and um, FEMA uh, uses historic data to uh, develop their firm maps, so they're really looking at historic flood events as a methodology of, of um, defining flood risk, which is uh, a, pr a problem because uh, with the, with uh, climate change and they were outdated, there was a miss there was a um, mismatch between flood risk and the maps. Yep. And so we're going through a phase right now that is that is challenging where um, there's, there are, um, it, there's an increase, there's a remapping, and there's an increase in flood insurance. <coughs> and basically the challenge is that the flood insurance has been subsidizing um, housing in coastal areas. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of a bigger national crisis in some ways. Mm -hmm. So those, those are issues. But I would say that the, um, one, w as that gets recalibrated, uh, there will be a slow process of sea level rise risk, although that does combine with um, flood risk, but really the near-term flood risks are where you're going to get a lot of the damage and, um, and kind of the challenges and also the, the, um, the concern and, the, and the, you know, the, um, the, the events that cause people to um, panic or to be you know, uh, nervous about the, si the situation. So I think part of this is thinking as a municipality about how to craft the communication to the public over time. 
especially because in Connecticut, it's we're different than other, um, you know, than like coastal North Carolina or Louisiana, where there's a ubiquitous flood risk. There's actually a fair number of houses that are not uh, particularly at risk in Connecticut, and there's pockets of risk. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's important to think about in your municipality how to be strategic about how you communicate the concerns and to be, you know, and um, just to make choices about how that communication occurs effectively. Uh, and to understand your risks, to, to map out and analyze the risks and to think about the infrastructure and particularly the egress routes and the evacuation routes, which is part of the reason why we, we mentioned that as a near-term priority for the municipality to really think about how the underlying, you know, bones of the town function that are going to function over time. So, and, and, and then I think with the flood risk and flood management, um, part, of the, part of the issue I think is that it's not just your municipality that faces this, so it's, it's, it's broad and I think that distributes the issue in some ways. <coughs> but I think communication, near-term communication is going to be key to anticipate some of the changes. And if yeah, someday we, we get a 100-year storm followed by an 80-year storm followed by a 60-year storm, history of flooding is, is more relevant than it was over the yeah. course of the previous 100 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Fortunately, we haven't been in that situation in Connecticut, but it only takes a couple hurricanes or a couple severe yeah. nor'easters to, to change that. Mm -hmm. back, back to your comment about the, the flood risk being a moving target, that is why the state requires <coughs> freeboard. Right. Right. So, th I mean, fundamentally, that's the purpose because we know that the flood risk today is not going to be the same as tomorrow. And so, um, in, in that way, adding some feet gives you some flexibility, some, some future proofing. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Any other questions, comments? Do you have any follow up comments or um, <coughs> anything else to wrap up? Are we good? It's been a pleasure working with you guys. Thank you. Hope to work again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for all your work on this. Very interesting. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, for bringing this forward. Um, this will Just be, the beginning. This will benefit the town for decades to come, um, for sure. Um, there's no denying the science behind this. Um, Bill, is this being communicated to the Zoning Commission? Do they have this report? They don't have this report. Okay, but we're getting there's a lot of zoning in here. I I'm not worried about I'll my report on that tomorrow night. Okay, excuse me. I'll just share, I'll share with you the chairman. The, the chairman uh, of the zoning commission was scheduled to be here this evening, okay. and uh, he had a, uh, a personal yeah, issue arise, so he was not uh, able to attend. So essentially, I'm representing him. This information has been shared with him consistently. He's been on the email mm -hmm. cha okay. chain relative to all of this. The full commission hasn't seen this yet, but we will be talking about it at some point. Uh, it won't be tomorrow night because we have a full agenda, but we'll get to it. Right. So, uh, you know, subcommittee and getting these regulations implemented into our thing, and um, it is a priority. Yes, absolutely. Um, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That's what the action is. The action is in zoning. <laughs> well, I think it. The OCD uh, too, as well. <laughs> Yeah, and permits. the road issue. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it transcends several Prior agencies. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I was just responding because I love zoning. Mm -hmm. um, coming from zoning. Uh, next on our agenda is the approval of the updated 2019 Board of Selectmen meeting schedule. When we did this, we, uh, well, because of the holidays, we thought, well, maybe we should push it off a month, a uh, week at the beginning of the year, but we really can't do that because that messes everyone else's schedule up. So the first month, is it January was the issue? So January, um, we have a meeting on the 2nd of January, um, our previous regular meeting schedule that we adopted, um, pushed it off a week. So we're going back to the first and third Wednesday of the month and correcting that, I should say, for the record and for uh, the town clerk to post. I'll move to approve the updated 2019 Board of Selectmen meeting schedule. Second. Any comments on that? Sorry for the confusion, folks. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Terrific. Uh, ex officio reports, um, Mr. Daigle? Uh, no meeting since our last meeting. I know Mr. Mr. Cunningham was at one. I was at two. Well, at least one, I should at say. Least at least yeah. one. I was at it. Well, let's see. I attended the... Uh, Board of Education meeting. 
Great. Another night, yeah. And uh, the uh, interesting thing, they're talking about moving the coastal classroom into central office. Um, and there seems to be, they've, they've got a map and, or a, a plan for, for doing it, and that would save uh, the, uh, the town uh, quite a bit of money every month, or save the Board of Ed quite a bit every month mm -hmm. if they can do it. And, uh, Seems like they have a, a viable plan on how to accomplish that. So I thought that was very interesting and a step in the right direction. Um, they also reported on the uh, elementary school alteration projects, and it seems that they're going along very smoothly, mm -hmm. particularly Niantic Center School is really uh, moving along very nicely, and some of the uh, students have moved into the new classrooms. And people that have been in those classrooms, it, it, it's just a whole different feel and environment and very upbeat and uh, good lighting. and uh, so. Mm -hmm. Sounds like uh, it's going to be a real, real jewel when they're done with that. Um, and then I, uh, I attended the uh, Historic uh, Properties Commission last night, and uh, our leader was there in attendance <laughs> the visit. And uh, uh, thirty seconds. Yeah, but you know they're really uh, trying hard. Uh, they spent a lot of time um, focusing on how they can work with the other organizations that uh, attend to the other historical properties. Uh, in in East Lyme in, in a way that will be more efficient and uh, uh, maybe benefit you know all the properties uh, in a positive way so they're really committed to doing that so I, that was good to hear that they're really trying to move in that direction so that's my report they do lots of good work and yes they do they're uh, very committed people and they are they take are a, they take a great interest in those properties we're lucky to have you as an ex officio too mm -hmm. you show great interest in that you help them along quite a bit from what i hear thank you mrs uh, mrs hardy uh, i don't have a report myself but i'm wondering if you're going to uh, give us an overview of the progress on the um, public safety building I will make mention of it um, in my ex officio report. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Nothing to report. Okay. Well, then I guess I got to report on that thing that you just talked about. I will talk about that on December 10th. That's this coming Monday at 7 p.m. at the East Lime High School Auditorium. Uh, we will put on a, a, um, a, the task force for the new police. No, it's a public safety building. We'll have much more than police in it and municipal building. Um, we, we will, uh, there's a task force in, involving um, uh, private citizens, volunteer citizens who are expert in certain fields, um, uh, people from the uh, members of the police commission, and uh, we also have department heads who are experts in their fields, especially public safety. Um, we'll, we'll, um, we'll put on a presentation um, I will be more of an observer than a presenter. Um, and that will be, again, this coming Monday, December 10th at 7 o'clock in the high school auditorium. It will also be uh, f uh, videotaped for future um, publication. We'll, we'll put it on the town website. It may even be live streamed that evening. And that's what I spent the last part of the day working on um, and maybe the first part of tomorrow, seeing if we can get that live and up and going. We have a uh, established um, a site on our town website, uh, a, a source of information for people who are looking for the facts on this um, um, as collated, as, as, as gathered by the um, by that task force. And that's on the town website. That is EL Town Hall dot com and um, just click through and there'll be a bunch of uh, information there including a couple of video presentations from various task force members who will give different viewpoints of where we are and where we need to be um, in addition to that we are also collecting questions so if anyone uh, would like to ask questions that um, especially if they're much more detailed and you need us to provide backup uh, we might not be prepared with all the information on, um, or all the backup information on Monday night. You, you can't anticipate every question that might come up, but we have you know piles and piles and piles of paper that we could provide, and if we know the questions in advance, it might help those asking the questions to get the answer that much quicker. Um, that is uh, a, an email that has been set up, questions, pluralized, questions, at eltownhall.com. Submit your questions and, and we will publish all the questions that we receive and the answers, not only on the website, um, 
um, yes, on the website and, and maybe the evening uh, at the high school. Um, it's moving along. We've gathered information. Um, we've um, toured the building a couple times. We went in the other day to take pictures so that we can present that at the forum. Um, we will also be doing a public tour of the current temporary police building. Um, and, and we will do that in a maybe next set i'm working on the date but we want to make uh, that available for the public to see but we're going to give the police some warning that would bring the public through their facility it all looks all kind of cute in the front you walked into the lobby and it's not so bad and you, you know it's a little tired in the lobby but we've had fixed it up and then when you're finally allowed to go behind the scenes you'll see uh, some of the issues of the building some of the structural issues we've toured the building as a, as a commission uh, within the last year, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, we have water issues, we have mold issues, we have... Um, and we've um, spent a great deal of money trying to maintain it as best we possible. We have maintained the building. We've spent hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars maintaining that building and um, that was always supposed to be a temporary facility. But we have space issues in that, in that facility as well, um, therefore um, bringing into problems of storage of... Um, materials, um, weapons, and uh, reports, and all the other things. We just don't have enough space. Um, standard, standard, um, um, the standards for a police department of this size is about 15 um, to 17,000 square feet, just the police part of it, um, and um, we are at 7,000 square feet. Um, there's, there's a lot that will come out in the meeting. Um, We've been doing a lot of work, and there's been a lot of social media um, chatter, and I don't say chatter in a, in a bad way, in a negative way, but it's also been helpful. It's been able to let the task force focus in on what the, what the folks are foc focusing in on. I, um, I must admit I was a little naive. I thought this was a slam dunk. I still believe it's a slam dunk. I think it's the best opportunity for the town when, when it's all presented, but it's great to see our citizens being involved and, and caring. And everybody that even puts up a negative comment is doing though doing that in the spirit of caring about the town that they live in and uh, that they treasure. So um, we welcome all questions and, and all viewpoints and um, uh, we look forward to uh, you coming on, on Monday night or at least tuning in or catching the replay on video. The before holiday stroll, if you did before if, you leave yes, that. I won't um, leave it. Yeah, go ahead. The uh, I zoning is my ex officio tomorrow night, and uh, I've already received several questions about why this is appearing on the zoning agenda when uh, this has not even been discussed publicly. So I wonder if you might address that. Um, we just lost Bill Mulholland. It would have been nice to actually for him to, um, to talk to uh, about that as the zoning enforcement officer. The uh, zoning approval has nothing to do with the police. Uh, whether it's appropriate to put a police building or not, well, it does. It, um, let me see it. How do I say it? The zoning approval is very simply, is that building in the correct zone to put a police building in? It doesn't necessarily approve the police building. Uh, that still has to go through many different um, um, steps including the board of selectmen will vote on that the board of finance will vote on that the townspeople will vote on that through a referendum should it uh, carry on through the process the zoning issue is very simply uh does the zoning um, board agree that this building which is in a light industrial area and already used for similar functions but because we're changing the use of the building it does need an 8-24 uh, approval don't know if that's what zoning calls it. I know that's what planning calls it. And we're just making sure that zoning also sees that, that it's an appropriate use for the building. Thank you. Is that, is, do you think that's um, a good enough explanation? I think so. Okay. Thank um, you. You've been around and uh, hang around zoning people for as long as I have and um, or longer. Um, so that's, it's not an approval for the use. It's not, a, it, we're not moving the police into that building based on tomorrow night's zoning approval um, should they approve the building it's very simply asking the zoning commission do you agree that the this could be a police station um, and uh, we do feel that it meets the zoning requirements 
Moving to the holiday stroll, if you missed it, you missed a, uh, the biggest and best ever. It was uh, quite